Um, just to say hello and welcome to Pavilion Stories from Victorian to Modern. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Pippa and I'm the head of fundraising at the Delaware Pavilion. And I'm here today with my colleagues, Matt, who is uh, our tech wizard for today, and my colleague, Dan, um, who is our fundraiser, if you want to give everyone a wave, Dan. <laughs> Um, and together, Dan and I look after the Delaware Pavilion members and patrons. On that note, we just want to say a big thank you to our members and patrons for attending today, but also for your ongoing support, particularly over the past year. Um, your support's been really phenomenal and yeah, we couldn't have done it without you. So big thank you to you. And we're also joined today by some members of Bexhill Museum. So hello and welcome. A little bit of housekeeping. I'll introduce our speaker Julian shortly and Julian will speak for about 30 minutes or so after which we're going to have a QA. and a um, If you have any specific questions on the presentation you can share them through the Q&A function on the bottom taskbar. Um, you can just write your question in and we'll be able to see it or you can also use the raise your hand function on the bottom taskbar um, at the end of the presentation if you want to ask a question verbally and Matt will unmute you so that you can speak to us. Um, Dan has kindly offered to chair the Q&A session so that we have a good mixture of questions and we're hoping to be finished by about half past five. So this Pavilion Stories event is the first in a new online series for our members and patrons, which explores the Delaware Pavilion's architecture and heritage. Today, it's a pilot event um, and we'd be really keen to hear your feedback. So we're sending out a short survey after the event. So please do have a look at that. Um, I'll introduce our speaker to, for today now, Julian Porter. Julian is the district curator for Rothers Museum Service and he's attached to Bexhill Museum as its curator. Uh, Bexhill Museum and Delaware Pavilion are long-term partners and um, we're really delighted to be welcoming them today. So I shall hand over to you, Julian. Thank you very much. Now it just requires me to master the technology as test pilot. So really what we're thinking about today is the relationship between the Delaware and the town. So I'll start with this simmering summer scene of the Delaware Pavilion. So this is about 1936. It's one of the early railway posters by Leslie Carr. Um, and it really looks like a mirage here. We've got the sea, sky, sand, and, and, and the Delaware Pavilion sitting there. And of course, the colonnade. So we're seeing Bexhill's two contrasting architectural styles, international modernism and late 19th century orientalism, um, mixing and matching. And I think a lot of people don't actually realize that there's a, there's a bit of, a, well, there's, there's a bit of a conflict between the two, but I wouldn't exactly say that they clash in this image. So, Bex Hill has been around for a very, very long time, but as a resort, it develops at the end of the 19th century, started by the 7th Earl Delaware, but really pioneered by his son, the 8th Earl Delaware. And this is the 8th Earl Delaware's Delaware Pavilion. This is the Curzal on Delaware Parade. Um, and this introduces the Orientalist style of architecture to Bexhill Seafront. So it was opened in 1896. And this style of architecture, architecture spread west towards the colonnade. So in many ways, this is the antithesis of the Delaware Pavilion. This was the eighth Earl's private development to generate money for the resort, but many, mostly to generate money for himself. And it's worth bearing in mind, this is where the 8th Earl met the actress, Miss Turner, at Christmas 1901, which caused the split in the family. So this is where the, divor the divorce really started in July 1902. So looking at the rival venue, the Central Parade, so I don't, although I need to be slightly careful here, I'm talking about Central Parade. This is Central Parade before it was developed. So this is about 19. 08. There's no colonnade. There's no promenade here at all. 
Uh, Central Parade is laid out in 1910 and it is completed by the opening of the colonnade in 1911. But you're seeing the important architectural features on the site, namely the Coast Guard cottages and some rather fine cabbages growing there in the gardens and allotments and the, the huge hotel block, the Metropole Hotel in the background there. Probably important thing to point out here is the flagstaff. We'll see a number of flagstaffs in and around this location. So the bit of land on which the colonnade was built in 1911 was called the Horn. Later on, it's just known as Coast Guard Cliffs. And from 1804 to 1870, it is the location of Martello Tower number 46. So the Coast Guard, the original Coast Guard was based here to keep Napoleon out and also to keep the local smugglers under control. So they really didn't have very many friends, the local Coast Guards. And you can see that flagstaff again. So the important thing here is this was where local people gathered for big occasions and to celebrate. The Coast Guard really were the only people with um, really authority in the area. They had fancy uniforms and this is where people would get together if they were going to celebrate. And that's something we see today with the Delaware Pavilion. So the site is significant. But coming back to Orientalism, we're seeing Central Parade here and the Cairo. So we're looking at this Moorish or Mughal architectural style. So we're looking at Islamic architectural forms as domes, minarets, arabesques. It's, well, it, I think it's perfectly normal for a Victorian seafront, but I, I suppose in many ways it could be considered a little bit odd. So on the left hand side, we are seeing the traditional build of the town centre, which is red brick and bath stone. And on the other side, well, I think that still is red brick and bath stone, but we're seeing the Orientalist side of Bexhill seafront. Now, the early resort was promoting itself to compete directly with the south of France. We never bothered taking on Hastings and Eastbourne. They, you know, we didn't consider them in our league. It was really the Côte d'Azur that we were taking on. So I guess we should expect some uh, North African influences to sneak in. So it's all about empire. It's all about our connections with the rest of the world here. So the last part of that Orientalist uh, development along the seafront was the colonnade. This was opened by Earl Brassey in 1911. And if you can see where my cursor is, there's Tom, there's Earl Brassey, mayor of Bexhill, famous, of course, for his voyages around the world on the, the steam yacht Sunbeam with dear Annie Brassey, who collected things, and we've got some here, and Hastings Museum have also got part of her important collections. Now, he was the ninth Earl Delaware's grandfather. So there's an awful lot of brassy DNA in the ninth Earl Delaware. And the colonnade here looking very impressive. I'm quite intrigued by this youths in the foreground there. I think they're waiting for skateboards to be invented so they can fully participate in this event. Now, well, this is an absolute and literal confection of a building. This appeared in the Bexhill Observer on the 3rd of June 1933, reprinting a picture from 1913, in which a local confectioner had made a sugar version of the colonnade and then upgraded it to show what sort of entertainment pavilion would go with it. Almost as soon as the colonnade paint was dry, they were looking to develop an indoor entertainment pavilion, a winter garden, because the colonnade is great when it's dry, but when it's raining, there are some obvious drawbacks. So there was this great um, desire to have a very fancy indoor pavilion. So really the roots of the Delaware Pavilion as a building go all the way back to 1912. So great was the desire that they did a little bit of Edwardian photoshopping here. Somebody has got a photograph of the Torquay Winter Garden and just dropped it in the back of this photograph of the colonnade. And you may also be able to see the Maharaja of Kuch Bahar's memorial fountain there. 
So there was some competition from the Kurzel site. The Kurzel could have been the location for a pavilion for the town, but I don't think it would have been a civic project. I think that would have been a private enterprise if it was a Kurzel extension. So there were many, many attempts to come up with a scheme. This is the 1930 scheme by Mayor Turner Lang. And it's quite nice. There's lots of features in it that I like. It's a 50,000 pound scheme. So this is where the 50,000 pound budget originally comes in from. It's sited slightly to the west of the colonnade. So the Maharaja of Kuch Bahar's memorial is preserved there. And a nice feature is that it included a museum. Well, as we were founded in 1914, we were already here, so I'm not quite sure what he had in mind for us at the time. The, let's show you one of my favorite cartoons for Bex Hill. It's a, it's, it's a little bit before our time here. It's 1932, so the finest night of the seaside, but I think it absolutely sums up Bex Hill in the 30s. Uh, how we were, I, I think I think it's not being too rude, I think we should take some of this at face value, but it's how our, our other people saw us, but I think we really were like it. It introduces the, the character of the gouty colonel. So it says, Bexhill is full of gouty colonels and majors moustaches. Each morning they bring them out to listen to the soft music which the sea breezes blow through them. Every time the residential major takes his moustache past the amusement park, it becomes so rigid with rage, it knocks his hat off. So there's lots of these gouty colonels with uh, very fixed opinions on everything, which um, is a force to be reckoned with in Bexhill. So I'm not suggesting this is too cruel a cartoon. I think it probably summed us up fairly well in the 30s. Definitely not a gouty colonel here we see the remarkable Ninth Earl Delaware, her brand, grandson of Annie Lady Brassy, the town's first socialist mayor. So very different from his predecessors, very different from his father. So a socialist, a pacifist, vegetarian theosophist. So an interesting character and his view for the pavilion scheme was my view is that if it will pay private enterprise, it is going to pay the town. So the Admiralty owned the Coast Guard cottage site. They were willing to part with it. So there was a bit of a scramble to make good use of this land. And it was really this choice between a private development or a civic development. And here we see that plot of land with the lovely Maharaja's memorial that had been put up in 1930 by the Maharaja's fa family to thank the town for their consideration to him and the family on their numerous stays in the town, but particularly when the Maharaja died here at 22 Marina Court Avenue in um, 1911. So at, at the same time the colonnade is being opened, the poor old Maharaja was dying in Bex Hill. This illustration is from Bexhill's 1930 development plan. It's by Adams, Thompson and Fry, and there's all sorts of interesting things going on here. It is proposing an extension to the colonnade. If you look at it too quickly, you don't realize quite how radical this is. This is putting in a major amphitheater behind the colonnade site. And as I was preparing the talk, I kept thinking about the theme of indoor, outdoor, particularly with COVID restrictions, sort of how useful it is to have this uh, alternation between indoor and outside um, spaces to use. And then not a Delaware pavilion here, uh, not even really modernist, almost postmodernist. It, it's, it's, I don't know what this is. It's almost like a branch of a local supermarket appeared. So we've got, we've got some interesting new designs creeping into Bex Hill. So a lot of thought going into this development. Now, Adams, Thompson and Fry actually come back and compete in the Reba competition that's run in the Architects Journal the 7th of September 1933. And 1934, when the um, competition uh, winners and runners up are announced, include their development, which has this, <clears throat> has this rather nice model in it as well. But we all know how the story ends. Eric Mendelssohn and Serge Chimea come up with a 1933 design, which is head and shoulders better than the competition. 
The following year, 1934, they build a model to show everybody what they were going to get, really on the understanding that a lot of people couldn't interpret architectural plans. So an actual model is something that everybody could appreciate. So this is what everybody was expecting. It incorporates some features that didn't make the final cut. So essentially it's the main building that is put in, but all the seafront structures are lost. So it was always designed to have its toes in the water. So we have a linking pergola going down to a large circular swimming pool, a pier and diving board going out to sea. But we also have Frank Dobson's Persephone sculpture in there as well. So even when the pavilion was opened, 12th of December, 1935, people still would have this model in their mind and were still expecting the other developments to come, but essentially there wasn't enough money to do them. There's been a lot of talk about resistance to the pavilion from town. And I think it's not so much of an architectural discussion, it's really all about the costs. So this is a cartoon from the Bexhill Independent newspaper. It wasn't terribly independent, it was awfully partisan from July 1935, uh, with quite a witty cartoon making fun of the statue. They don't know what the statue is going to be at the moment, and it really doesn't matter. The problem is it's going to cost the ratepayers of Bexhill a thousand pounds. What they would have made of Dobson's Persephone is difficult to say. This is Bexhill's lost goddess. She should stand on the Delaware Pavilion Terrace. So she is the goddess of the underworld who comes back during the spring and summer. So I, I tend to describe her as the goddess of summer holidays, but there's a darker side to her nature as well. So this is Bexhill's missing statue, our missing goddess. The site was cleared at the end of 1934, and this is February 1935, where we see the foundations and steel frame begin to go up. So we're dealing with a new type of architectural form. We're dealing with international modernism, but also a new construction technique. This is using a welded steel frame. So this is quicker, lighter, uh, cheaper, than a riveted steel frame construction. And I quite like the special welding headgear that the chap has got there. At least he's got something to protect his eyes, but it looks like he's out there in a suit and overcoat, just getting, getting that Delaware welded all together. The famous steel frame here. And of course, we shouldn't forget that this was during the depression. So a big chunk of the project really was as a job creation scheme. It was to create employment. And as far as it was possible, local contractors were used. Um, one of the problems is this is such a new architectural style that this was a European building style that hadn't really uh, embedded itself into England at this time. So they were really learning on the job at this point. This is the Bexhill Town Band, or smartly turned out on the 6th of May, 1935, for the ceremony of the laying of the Jubilee plaque. And you can see the building is coming on very well. They'll really have to get a move on to get this complete for Christmas that year, but the steel frame is there. Some of the concrete is in place and there's some block work in as well. And here we can see the plaque right at the top, ready to be lowered down there. So this is George V's Silver Jubilee, and we see the Delaware family lined up. So we see Ninth Earl Delaware. He's born in 1900, so we know he's, not, he's 35 in 1935, with his wife, Diana Delaware, who managed and ran the Cooden Beach Hotel, and the three children. So on the left, we have Baron Buckhurst, the future Tenth Earl Delaware, Lady Kitty there, and we have Harry there. Now, unfortunately, Harry was killed during the Second World War. And we also have the deputy mayor, Mayor uh, Stridinger, and the lady mayor there. So they were actually mayor and mayoress when the Delaware Pavilion opened in Christmas because the Knightfield mayoralty had ended at that time. 
And this is an absolutely wonderful postcard showing everybody turned out, mostly girl guides actually lining the walls there for the Duke and Duchess of York's arrival to open the pavilion on the 12th of December, 1935. A lovely clear early image. You can see the these are sort of little brown strips between the large blocks of concrete there. They were in ex expansion gaps, sort of rubberized expansion gaps. So if, if the concrete expanded or contracted in the cold or uh, warm weather, they wouldn't crack. And it's looking splendid and pristine here. I love this curve of the wall going around there near the stage area as well. But I think that's one of my favorite images of the pavilion. So the Duke and Duchess of York appear here. Uh, again, this is Mayor Stridinger greeting them, and there is her brand, Knightville, Delaware, in the background. Of course, they were, they were, he was no stranger to the royals. I popped down to see him and Lady Delaware at the Cooden Beach earlier on and actually had an unofficial tour of the business, of the building site. The Knightville was fantastically well connected, so the Prime Minister would often pop in to see him at Bexhill, or the royals would come down to see him. Really a huge advocate for the town. And we're inside here, we're in the restaurant and we're seeing the mural by vorticist Edward Wadsworth. So that was drawn by Charles Howard. So the design was by Wadsworth. It was actually executed by Howard. There wasn't enough money in the budget to pay for this. So it actually was paid for by Deputy Mayor Cuthbert. And the story I've been told, I'm not sure if it's true, but I, it probably is, that, it, that they actually the waitresses in the restaurant used to pin the orders onto, the, onto that there. So there was a restoration project in 1954 to get it looking a little bit better again. And we see here, well, this is Mr. Rhodes, the manager of the Delaware Pavilion. I used to think this was uh, a late 35 picture. I've actually worked out now that this is it's getting towards the end of the season, 1936. So this is actually 26th of September, 1936. And he's there with the pavilion staff, really showing off the various uniforms that they had, depending on what part of the building they were working in. These are modifications of Bexhill Borough uniforms because this was a civic development, so they were part of the borough. And they have a little badge on there as well with Delaware Pavilion written on. And the colours are the town colours of red, green and white. And it's always good to see that colour scheme. The postcard here, again, it's, it's very, very new. The pavilion is it's only just been opened. So this is probably 36 season and we can tell because we can see the uh, ball game nets on the roof of the pavilion and we can see some very interesting planting these little groups three trees there are three trees there's a little cluster of three flagpoles as well and also we can see the model boat pond there and somebody's just ditched their bike on the pavement there this is the first railway poster for Bex Hill to feature the Delaware pavilion this was by V.L. Danvers, so it must be the 1936 season. Again, we're seeing the beach, very important. So we see the colonnade and the Delaware Pavilion mixed together here. The original plan was to tear down the colonnade, just get rid of it, put St. Modernist in, but they couldn't afford to do that, so it was re retained. What is interesting is we see the pergola. Now, the pergola was never completed, but in this illustration, it had been completed and it's actually in use. So it never got this far developed. Another very famous image of the Delaware Pavilion. For a long time, I thought this was 1936, but after sort of poking around newspaper cuttings and trying to make a match, it's actually much later than I thought. This is probably, as a possibility, it, 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 it not, but it, the probability that this is the 3rd of July 1939. So this is only two months before the Second World War started. So we have the Daily Mirror 8, who are pro pro professional keep fit experts who would do this keep fit routine for the benefit of the spectators and this is my sort of keep fit somebody does it for you and you watch but then afterwards they would invite members of the crowd to join in and they would soundly thrash them nobody could actually compete with them so the idea of keep fit physical ex ex um, exercise um, was very much in the mindset of the Knightville Delaware there was this um, 
desire to improve the mind as well as the body. So, of course, the pavilion had its own library as well. I think the library had actually gone by this, this point. It didn't survive very long, unfortunately. And we see a nighttime view, some evening use of the pavilion. I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. It's somewhere between 36 and 38. The event has spilled out onto the terrace. It looks like the pavilion windows have been slid open, so we're looking out onto the restaurant. I suspect there's some sort of a musical event here, but it's the lighting that's very, very interesting, particularly these freestanding mushroom-shaped down lighters. They, they must have their own internal power supply because uh, there's no sign of cables, and I don't think there's any, any sockets in the terrace at that point. So something going on and people are sitting outside and enjoying probably, probably music. And on the 11th of July, 1936, Bexhill's, well, arguably Bexhill's two main unique selling points, motor racing and the Delaware Pavilion, collide with the 1936 Concourse d'Elegance. So some lovely cars being displayed on the terrace. We can see in the background, it looks like those mushroom downlighters have been rolled into the corner, but also we can see the blinking pergola. It's a three-dimensional structure, it's not a fence, and there are these N-shaped supports that would have held a walkway. So as far as I know, no attempt was ever made to lay that walkway, but very much showing here that people were just called off the job. They'd started building this, and they suddenly stopped. And of course, behind that, we have our Orientalism back. We see Marina Court Avenue 22, the closest bungalow where the Maharaja of Kuch Bahar died in 1911, and all the copper domes. So this is what um, John Betjeman refers to as the copper domes of Kuch Bahar. Really, the first big cultural success for the Delaware was the Paul Robeson concert on the 22nd of March, 1936. This was so well attended, they actually had to put seating on the stage as well. Absolutely packed performance. It went down tremendously well. So this was a huge milestone in the history of the pavilion. It was the first big cultural success and arguably without the pavilion we wouldn't have been able to have a, a show of this quality in the town so beginning to earn its keep here um an event of slightly different proportions was gray owl's visit in 1937 so the canadian Indian grey owl come to speak about conservation. Of course, we now know that grey owl was Archie Bellaney from Hastings, so actually didn't have to come that far after all. Very close to the end of his life here, so even though he wasn't actually what he made himself out to be, his conservation message is very, very important, of course, still very, very, very relevant. So big names coming and performing or speaking at the pavilion. Going back to 1936 here, this is the 19th of September, and we see the old pavilion, the old Kurzel, being demolished. So, of course, this is where the eighth Earl Delaware ran off with Miss Turner, so that's going. And also the fun fair that the gouty colonels objected to was this site here. So this is now the Bexville Sailing Club site, but this was actually a fun fair in the early 30s, and there's a rumour that Billy Butlin was involved with this. He, the, the connection may just be via supplying dodging cars. We, we've never really traced this story back. So as soon as the Delaware is open, the old pavilion site is demolished. And also we see another welded steel frame here on the other side. We see the Ritz Cinema on Buckhurst Road under construction, the biggest and grandest of the town's cinemas. So now, sadly, long gone. Do we have a look back inside the pavilion? This is the 9th of April, 1938, and it's the Information Bureau at Easter. And looking very closely, I can see that the people there are looking at the official guide to the corporation from 1938. I've got a copy of that in the archives. I get the feeling the lady there is thinking, come and make your mind up, decide what you want to do today. And this is also rather impressive. This is the um, 8th of October 1938 and we're seeing the stage lighting system which requires two hands 
and one foot. So very sophisticated, a very high tech lighting system was put in. There are parts of the early stage that are lost. The cyclorama that went behind was a casualty of the war, but when it was put in, cutting edge technology for the pavilion stage. And here we are. This is the Bexhill Museum Association annual social from the 19th of um, March, 1938. I've got a feeling the lady behind the plow, the flower pot there is saying, have you paid your subs yet? So this is us. I've got a feeling this might be my audience today, but I shouldn't say that. And then 1939, we move into the wartime period. So this is the Delaware Pavilion canteen staff and some youngsters there filling sandbags from the beach to protect the colonnade. So this is during the phony war period when we knew the war was coming, but no bombs had been dropped on the town at that time. And this is Christmas 1940. This is one of Laurie Dre's wonderful photographs of the town. Laurie Dre, who was attached to the Bexhill Amateur Athletic Association, had a camera and used it freely. He wasn't supposed to be taking wartime pictures of Bexhill, but I'm very pleased that he did. We're seeing the terrible winter of 1940 with all the snow that's depicted in our winter wartime model railway. And we can see some white stripes on the bottom of the post there. This is for the blackout. But what we may be seeing running along the front of the pavilion there is a brick or concrete blast wall. There were modifications to protect the pavilion from bomb damage. And this may actually be showing that. We can also, of course, see trolley wire cables overhead. And on the 30th September 1940, a bomb did drop on the pavilion. This is the Metropole. So this was the uh, conservatory area. So this is the east side of the Metropole Hotel facing the Delaware Pavilion Auditorium. And I actually think the auditorium took the main part of the bomb damage. So we've got no photographs that show it, but the pavilion was probably in worse state than this. And of course, most of what we know about Bexhill during the Second World War, we know from Spike Milligan. This is from his 1971 book, Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. So Spike tells us, on Bexhill's seafront stood the Delaware Pavilion, named after Lord Delaware Pavilion, a fine modern building with absolutely no architectural merit at all. It was opened just in time to be bombed. The plane that dropped it was said to have been chartered by the Royal Institute of Architects, piloted by Sir Hugh Casson with John Betjeman as bomb aimer. And it calls to mind Betjeman there, come friendly bombs, fall on Bex Hill. But he goes on to say, the invasion of England, though always imminent, did not stop the reopening of the pavilion for dances by the local Rotary Club. And we have a photograph of one of those Rotary Club dances. This is the 19th of April, 1941. <coughs> Excuse me, I think we, in the past, had this idea that really everything stopped in Bexhill, and particularly at the pavilion during the war, but there's an awful lot of wartime activity. So this is the Rotary Dance. There is a band in the background, and there's somebody going absolutely berserk on a trumpet. So there's a good possibility that's actually Spike we're seeing in the background there. So it had a military use. It also had emergency civilian use as well. The British restaurant that started in the Edgerton Park Theatre moved in 1941 into the Delaware Pavilion. So this is the auditorium. It looks like some block work, some bricks or something on the outside of the glass. So I think this is the inside of the blast wall that shielded the south side. So the blast wall was there so the auditorium could safely be used even if there were bombs falling. So the idea of the British restaurant is the food provided there was off ration. So it was somewhere you could always go and get a decent meal. And I get the feeling that because of all this work, the pavilion really won its spurs during the Second World War because it proved to be so useful. And probably from a photographic point of view, this is the clearest image we have of the inside of the pavilion during the war. Um, this is actually the 17th of October, 1942. So well into the war here, it is a scout show, although there's lots of guides in there 
as well. Not really sure what's going on. The scout master there, I'm not sure whether he's teaching them how to lasso campfire. Um, I saw it is saying to first douse this with petrol, then throw on a match. So I don't know whether they're trying for their arson award there or not. It's very, very strange. We can see some soldiers lurking around in the background as well. And this is something I recently discovered. This is Gracie Field's visit to Bexhill, specifically to the Delaware Pavilion. So the 18th of September, 1943, she comes in for an ENSA performance to rally the troops. So again, this is something specifically for the service people. This isn't, this isn't for the townsfolk, this is for the uh, army personnel based in the town during the war. And good use was made of the auditorium for boxing. So the entertainment really didn't follow the lines of um, sort of, um, really sort of, I suppose it, it is health, but I guess it, it's not the high culture we might think. The, the, the shows that were put on were what were popular, what would actually get people to turn out. So this is the military boxing finals here, and you might be able to spot an alto table being used there. So this is the 4th of March, 1944. And of course, 1944 is when Johann Schreiner produced his war damage and improvement reports. And really taking forward that idea of using the auditorium for boxing. So this is for sort of in the round performance. So actually, normally where the seating is, that's where, that's where the action would take place and designing seating to fit around that. But more importantly, it was repairs, but it was also suggestions for improvements and additions. And those additions included a huge dance hall on the east end of the building. This is on the first floor. You actually would drive under it. And also, this is suggesting that that pergola would have made a return. So unfortunately, it really wasn't financed for anything other than patching up the building. So the additions never made it through. So the pavilion playing its part in post-war recovery. So this is the bubbling over program for the 8th of July, 1947. So the big summer shows are coming back and a really interesting photograph of the town in 1947 there. 47, of course, we're also looking at the end of empire. So things are really beginning to change for Bexhill. There are a few gouty colonels before the end of the empire. There are a lot more gouty colonels headed in our direction after that. And we have some school productions. This is Ancaster House putting on a show about 1951. Um, there have been over 200 schools in Bexhill and certainly before the Second World War started, there were 46 private schools. So schools and independent schools were a huge part of the town's economy. So big shows, schools getting involved, big summer shows here, huge crowds here. This is the 8th of September, 1951. And this is the crowds going back around the Metropole to see Starlight Rendezvous. And we're seeing Freddie Frinton there, who took part in Starlight Rendezvous, and of course, very famous now for his sketch, Dinner for One from 1963. Another beautiful, I do like these nighttime scenes of the Delaware Pavilion. So we've got a big summer show here. The repertory companies would get kicked out during the summer, so they would perform in the Edgerton Park Theatre, and after the summer shows, they were allowed back into the Delaware. But community use as well, this is something I recently discovered. So this is a Farley School of Drama putting on a production of the prodigious snob at the Delaware. Fortunate, unfortunately, the date only tells us this is the 3rd of December. I think it's about 1955. The Farlia School of Drama is important because it was run by Christine Porch and Isabel Overton, and they went on to create the Bexhill Costume Museum in 1972, which is now part of us. But there's some interesting people in the cast. If you look carefully, Lucille is performed by a young Julie Christie. She went to St. Francis's School on the Down, but clearly was involved with the Thalia School of Drama as well. Another famous face here. Uh, so we have Cliff Richard here. This is October 1960. So we actually, I'm really intrigued by the view here of that little bit of, that's a little bit of surviving wall 
from the Metropole Hotel, which has got the little bit of guttering. I'm really always interested in that, but I guess we should be looking at Cliff there. So we're getting some big names. He, he was quite famous by this point. So putting on a show, lots of activities for the youngsters. So mob scenes at Jazz Festival at the Delaware Pavilion. So this is the 15th of October, 1960. And it's all a little bit too much for that young lady there. This is the 25th of May, 1963, and we can see, I'm not sure how many people remember this, this is the pavilion bar being fitted. So this is all about making the pavilion cosy. Arguably, the townspeople never understood it architecturally. Uh, it was just a building to be used and modified. So this was an attempt to uh, uh, make it more like the building perhaps that they were expecting. So this is where some of the flock wallpaper starts to get installed. So it's a little bit like thickening of arteries. There's all this accretion on the inside of the building that's not really fit with the architectural style. More important visitors. We have the Queen visiting 25th of May 1963. So a very wet day, a rather somber occasion. Actually her next visit after this was Wales to Aberfan. So it, it, it wasn't uh, really a, a, as cheerful an event as it might have been and certainly the weather wasn't helping at this point. Again, me looking at the background, you can see the shiny new windbreak screen that was put in in 1965 there. So here we are in April 1969, um, a rather bleak view of the pavilion, just looking at the bare concrete with some fairly obvious cracks in it. And then we zoom on to 1970, we can see an attempt to grow some ivy up. It, clearly this ivy has not appeared overnight. We see it developing throughout the 60s. So this is about 1970 when it's nearly taken over. And there's some lovely fairy lights running across the top. I was gonna to make some fairy light jokes, but I realize we've got some fairy lights up at the moment and very nice they look too. So again, this is an attempt to try and make the building more familiar. I'm not sure what the next stage after this. I suspect they were thinking about some mock Tudor beams to be added onto the outside. And the little sign that I quite like saying bars. So this is, this is really, it, they're more interested in the beer than anything else at this point. I'm being a little bit unkind. It's not really true. There's some very interesting stuff going on throughout this period. So it's a folk music festival. So this was for the um, 30th of August, 1965. So there's a workshop in the East Wing and in the lineup they've actually managed to get Paul Simon who apparently also performed at the New Inn as well in Sydney. Um, so some really really interesting things going on. So even though we get this idea the building is a bit neglected there's lots of important stuff going on inside and of course the most famous of these events is the concert by Johnny Nash and Bob Marley. So Johnny was an established artist at this time. Bob wasn't really very well known. He just performed in London. So we think this was Bob Marley's first performance outside of the capital. And this was a fundraising event for a local school. So this and the Paul Simon Folk Music Festival were private bookings. They weren't programmed by the Delaware Pavilion. It was other people using the site for their own, for their own events which is one of the reasons we know so little about them, that it, it, we really had to fight to find these cuttings. We had heard that it's taken place, but there are no big posters for them. And here we see Dear Spike again. Although the first reading of some of those lines from Adolf Hitler, my partner's downfall, we might get the idea he wasn't very keen on the Delaware Pavilion. It's more to do with his view on architecture and it's not really a reflection on his relationship with the building. Spike loved the Delaware Pavilion. He had very fond mem memories of it from when he was there with his D battery. He's here in, this is the 25th of May, 1974. He's there with his wife, Paddy, looking out into the distance saying, I think he's probably saying, here they come. So whether he's talking about Hitler or whether he's talking about the goons, I'm not really sure. So he loved the building. He, he wasn't that keen on the style, but it was the things that were going on inside that were more important to him. So, I love this cutting, it's, it's hilarious. This is the 5th of October, 1974. Bunny girls or dolphins? 
I'm not quite sure why that's a, an or. I think it could be bunny girls and dolphins, but I'll, I'll just leave that one there. They're consulting with the public on what to do with the building. So it's sort of shades of boating that boat face. We had this with the Kurzel as well. They were going to rename that during the First World War because it sounded a bit German, and they got some stupid ideas back. Here they are consulted. So somebody thinks it should either be a dolphinarium, which I am guessing that they mean is to fill it up with water and have the dolphins swimming around on the inside um, and one of the suggestions here I think we just end up with is just pull it down so clearly some issues there another great Delaware pavilion headline here 28th of March 1981 no loving at the pavilion fears that the Delaware pavilion was to be used for sex orgies at the weekend were unfounded so presumably there were no refunds either so it's a little bit of acupuncture so that was a little bit too much for the gouty colonels in the 80s but we've not seen anything yet and famously Bexhill king of the witches Alex Sanders curses a production at the Delaware pavilion on the 28th of February 1985 a lovely quote from Gillian um, his wife there, which I hopefully you can see or read for yourself. I won't read it out to you. So it's a bit of a falling out, but as you might expect, getting the internationally famous King of the Witches to curse your production actually was pretty good publicity for the show. And here we see things beginning to turn around. 26th of September, 1985, Princess in Rags. So people are beginning to realize that architecturally the building is really important and needs to be protected. But some lovely but quite cutting quotes here. So a cross between an old person's home and a British rail buffet um, and says the Edinburgh room has been turned into a poor parody of a provincial Indian restaurant. He says Victoria and Festival of Britain plastic comforts its aged users. So it's a little bit too cruel in some ways, some of these cuttings, a little bit too uh, ageist and a little bit too elitist for, in my view, but at least people are realizing that something actually has to be done to save the structure. So the Pavilion Trust is created. They first of all stop the building falling down, which is incredibly important, and then embark on the process to restore it. And of course, very, very, very famous person, our joint patron, Eddie Izzard here, worked at the Delaware Pavilion early on, and a little bit like Spike Milligan, very, very fond of the building. And again, it's as much as what was going on inside the building as what the building looks like itself. So again, our wonderful shared patron there, which brings me back to my last image. We're going back into the night, this is a Frank Sherwin railway poster of the pavilion from 1947. I enjoy this one because I've cut the quote off because you, you see less of the picture, but actually the title of the poster is Bexhill on the sunny Sussex coast. Nobody seemed to spot the irony um, that it was, it was taken at night. So thank you for listening so patiently. Um, I think really to sum up is that despite the ups and downs with the building, there was always something going on in the building, something that people enjoyed. Sometimes it was the building that people enjoyed. Sometimes it was the activities that were going on. And quite often it was both. Right now, I've got to work out how to, how to escape from this so you can talk to me back. Have I done this right? Yes, you have indeed, Julian. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you for that talk. I think for all of us, regardless of how much we knew about the pavilion already, or maybe didn't know, there were many, many fascinating images and stories um, about both the building and its people that you've unearthed there in very little time. I'm going to open up for questions from everybody in a moment, but we've already had some submitted during the presentation. Um, first of all, David wants to know, at the front of the pavilion, there's a bus shelter in the modernist style. Um, when was that built? And then is it later than the pavilion itself? 
Oh, I'd have to knit back and let me see if it's in that picture. Um, just fighting my way through. I presume it's contemporary, but we'll quickly find out. Um, Yeah, where am I? You? No, I'm not seeing it. No, I don't think it's. It's not in that postcard where the opening takes place. So I don't know the answer to that one, but that's a brilliant question. I think we're going to have to do a little bit of research on that one. It's wonderful to think that somebody locally or someone at the council was inspired enough to riff from the pavilion style when commissioning that bus stop. It's um, possible it's one of Shriner's improvements from 44. So, um, but I don't know, that's just a guess. Uh, another question that's come in, which is something I was interested in as well, from Judy and John, is what happened to Dobson's statue? Um, and when was that idea kind of finally killed off? Well, it's when the money runs out, they can't find their thousand pounds, they can't pay. The, the legend is that it was in his studio and was blown up by a bomb in World War II. We, it, I mean, that could well have happened. It, it, was, I mean, it's, it was a big old thing, that he, even the maquette. We see a small version displayed in the pavilion in 35. He's obsessed with Persephone, so we know that there are a number of different maquettes and studies for it. So there's several different ones. I think certainly some versions survive, but whether the one we were going to get survived, I'm not sure. That's possibly the one that got blown up. Okay. If anybody else has a question that they've thought of or that suddenly come to mind, you can raise your hand um, to ask a question verbally or even on video if you so wish, and Matt will let you in. Um, if not, you can submit any further questions through the chat. Um, and I've also got one other question, if nobody else has anything they wish to ask. So someone's raised their hand. So Graham, what would you like to ask? should be up to here, Graham, in a moment. I'm unmuted now. Uh, um, yes, I was going to ask Julian about the dance hall at the end of the pavilion, which I believe you said was at the east end, but in fact it was at the west end. Um, it's, well, they never built it, um, but it would have been at the east end, um, so it would have been over the model boat pond. Uh, it wasn't according to the uh, the picture showing the pavilion. It showed it as being at the west end. You're right. Um, it's got to be. I it, stand it, to be it's correct. Got to be on the, it's got to be on the Hastings side because there's nowhere there's, there's there's nowhere else to there's nowhere else to put it. Oh, okay. Um, because we would have hit. Oh. It would have been Metropole Hotel on the other side. No. No. Okay. Because I think uh, what we I'm also tend to forget is what car park now is, is under uh, Marina Court. So it was actually fairly squidged on both sides, but there was a little bit of expansion space on the east side. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Thank you, Graham. And Williams would like to ask another question. Yes. Hello there. Hello. Oh. Um, Talking about the Maharaja's memorial, where did it go? Where is it now? 
Oh, goodness. Please. That's a, that's a good question. Nobody knows is the answer to that. We know what happened to it in 34 is that it was moved into Edgerton Park and it was just at the bottom of the ramp by the Shore Start building. So actually even the footings for it are still there. But in the mid 60s, it goes off for repair and never comes back. So it's a great mystery what happened to the Maharaja Kuch Bahar's memorial. Thank you. Okay, another question um, from Anthony is, is it true that the Germans during the Second World War used the Delaware to identify where they were when flying over the South Coast? Apparently so, apparently so. There is a, there's a newspaper cutting. Um, it was one of John Dowling's interview. They had somebody speaking at the Delaware and I think it was, it was a, a um, it, in later life, a German airline pilot who had been in the Luftwaffe confirmed it. I think that the, the, the story gets slightly complicated because one version of the, of the story is that they didn't blow it up because it was such a good navigation aid. Well, they did blow it up. So that part isn't true. Um, but clearly it was one of the most recognizable buildings on our length of seafront. Um, so they certainly were using it for navigation, but they weren't intentionally trying to, to, to spare it either. Okay, fantastic. So it's not just an urban myth. Um, Matt, Matthew Bolton's got a question about the building itself. Um, he's asked, are the internal radiators running in the glass at the front of the building built when the pavilion was originally erected? Yes, that's an original fi feature to stop the, stop the glass fogging up. Yes, which is obviously incredibly timely given some of the works that they're going to the glass at the moment. Yes, um, yes. I mean, I mean, the other thing, I, as I'm sure you all know, that because of this lack of money, they had to de degrade the specification for the buildings. They should have been bronze fixtures for most of the windows and picnics. So the, the building should have lasted a lot better than it actually did, but that was because of this um, cost-saving um, event right at the end where they had to drop all the seafront development. They actually had to go for a slightly cheaper build as well to bring the building in on budget. Okay. Talking of things which were cost engineered, so to speak, Anna's asked, has there ever been a more recent plan to build a circular swimming pool um, at the front of the pavilion? As that's something that seemed to be quite prevalent in a lot of the plans and kept coming back as an idea, the idea of kind of expanding the colony. So when was, do you know any other instances where that's come up recently? There's lots of there's lots of different schemes to do all sorts of different things. I can't remember another attempt to put in a swimming pool there. Um, because I mean, one of the attempts they were actually going to roof over all of the terrace to, to actually roof terrace right across to the to the colonnade and have that as a sort of a, a single story development. But I, I don't think. I think that the, the circular swimming pool idea was, was shot down so successfully in 1935 by the Bexhill Independent uh, that it, it didn't come back. Okay. Um, and then I've got a question from Sally asking what kind of reception did Paul Robinson get from the town when he performed? They loved him. Absolutely loved him, loved the performance. I'd say it was this thing, it was over capacity. They were seating people actually on the stage to get people in everybody wanted to see this show that was that was the big ticket to have and again if we didn't have the pavilion i don't think he would have he would have come so culturally that was that was the that was the, that's marked the arrival of the delaware pavilion i think that paul robson concert of course if paul robson would have been the only per person even further to the left than earl delaware at the time so again again it's one of those odd mixes you wouldn't necessarily think he went down well but it, he he did go down well but the townspeople were kind of incredibly open, I guess, to any kind of major big name entertainment at that time. I think so. so. And I think this idea that we we, we uh, didn't like the Delaware Pavilion, I, I'm not sure that that, you know, that the cost is what people objected to. But I think they were very proud to have this because, you know, we wouldn't have liked it if Eastbourne had got it. We wouldn't have liked it if Hastings had got it. We were very proud that it, it came here because it was so bold so new and of, of, of at least national significance, well, actually international significance, everybody was very interested in the building. Yes. Okay, and 
finally, pick out one more question. We've got a lot more questions than we can get through, unfortunately. Um, so the final question we will go to We'll go to Rod, who asked, when was the Metropole Hotel demolished? He said it took a lot of bomb damage. Oh, goodness. I mean, it sits there as a burnt out ruin for absolutely ages. So it's there until the 50s. Um, I think it's actually mid 50s before they actually take it down. Um, it's it, it has a, it, it's a fair, fairly un unfortunate building that the RAF set fire to it in May 1940. And then the Luftwaffe come along and they finished the job in September. Um, so it can't be used after that point. Well, so it can't be used. They actually used it for a ARP training afterwards as a bombed out shell. But it sits there looking awful for a very, very long time. I think it's sort of mid 50s before that before they actually take the thing down. OK, I guess I expect that was kind of typical, given how much there would have been to do immediately after the war, things like that. Yeah, one. yeah. I mean, it's not the only bombed out building in the town. There's a huge amount of destruction. And Pippa, there was one final question, I think. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, th there was just a question from Rachel, age 10, which I think we should answer, <laughs> um, who asks, when did the Cairo change into arcades? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Uh, I wish I had the answer to that one. It caught me out there. Um, I, the Cairo, they talk, talk about it as the Cairo in sort of 1900, 1910-ish. I think they just call it Marina Arcade really after the First World War, but I, I don't know when the name changes. The idea of having games and amusements, um, I mean, that was something they had at the Curzol from the 1890s, so that, that wasn't a new thing. The postcard we see of the of the Cairo, it's a sort of um, novelty shop. So you'd have gone in there and you bought some postcards or you would have bought a toy boat to sail on the beach. So it's not arcade games as it is now, but in that development, they would have been similar games. I think probably it's going to be 50s, I would guess, but that that's a guess. I don't really know. You've caught me out there. Good question to end on, even you don't know the answer no i'm stumped you okay. beat me finally just to wrap up because we have gone slightly over time i just want to say thank you again to julian for taking the time to present the talk and to dig out those fantastic images from the archive um, i appreciate how many there were to go through and how much content you could have picked and i think you picked out some absolutely fantastic stories and thank you to everyone who's come. I hope you've learned something new. I know I certainly have. And thank you for, as Pippa said at the start, continuing to support us as members and indeed support the museum if you're one of their members. Please do visit once we can reopen both at the pavilion and at the museum. If you've never been to Bexhill Museum, it is well worth going. And Hopefully, we'll see you at a future pavilion story. Yeah, and just to say, I'm really sorry we haven't managed to get through all the questions today, but if you do want to follow up, please um, do email Dan or myself and we can pass you your questions on to Julian. Um, there's been some amazing points raised in the questions that we've not been able to get to. So, yeah, and we do hope to see you at a future event. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. It's a pleasure.